Uh, hello, welcome to everyone to, to today's webinar on teaching derivatives, securities, financial markets, and risk management. A practical guide brought to you by World Scientific Publishing and supported by our partners, Field Books and Sri Adhya. Event will begin. Good morning, and, or good evening, where, where many of you are. Um, I am Robert Jaro, Professor of Finance at Cornell University. Um, I create financial models, many of which are now standard in use by financial institutions and central banks around the world. My former student, Arca, and I wrote this textbook. Um, an Introduction to Derivative Securities, Financial Markets, and Risk Management. This is an introductory book on the topics mentioned in the title. We introduce derivatives simply and intuitively using the standard approaches by now familiar to previous textbooks and courses that teach derivatives. But I believe ours is better and a more unified presentation with intuitive examples and a more focused presentation of models than in other textbooks. Now, even in an introductory book, it is important for students to be exposed to current thinking as represented by current research. Why? Because students will be working in these markets in the future and the standard techniques in the future or what is in the current research today. With respect to derivatives, current research has been studying term structure models for interest rates, foreign currencies, and credit derivatives, asset price bubbles, and market manipulation. For example, the recent LIBOR scandal or maybe even high frequency trading. These are topics that students read about in the financial press. They are relevant to practice and students will want to understand them and how they affect what they are learning. These topics are in our book. This is so because my life's research has focused upon these topics. To our knowledge, there are no other textbooks, especially introductory textbooks, that have this material within it. Derivatives and financial risk management is neither exotic nor esoteric. Along with investments, fixed income securities, universities and insti institutions routinely offer courses on derivatives. Myself, I personally believe it should be part of the core curriculum. Derivatives are very important for business students, for traders, for accountants, for regulators, and for personal investment. In short, for everybody. With that, I'm going to pass over the remaining part of the presentation to Arca, who will tell you how we did this uh, in our book. Thank you. And Arca, um, passing the baton to you. Thank you, Bob. Do, yeah. Yeah, do uh, so, energy, please. thank you. So we lay the uh, the ground um, uh, here and, oh, by the way, can you please share the screen? Let me turn on the screen share. Uh, good evening, everyone. Let me just get the, the screen up and running. Okay. Can you see me? Can you see the slides? Okay, so let me get started. Uh, thanks again, Bob. So that is what we do. It's an introductory text, but we also have deep research insights built in there. Uh, sometimes woven into the text, sometimes as separate inserts, extensions, we call them where you have and where the instructors can choose what advanced topics that they would like to teach their students. 
So today's plan is we'll talk about our teaching and studying approach and ideas, an introduction to derivatives, macroeconomic forces shaping the markets, teaching major derivatives pricing models, how to present, how to teach interest rate derivatives, including a special case of heat Jarrow morton model, widely used. Use of derivatives, but be careful about abuses with an eye towards the regulators. We'll talk about efficient use of ancillaries and also what we have for the regulators, for traders, for finance professionals, and for accountants. And then contact information at the end. Uh, many of you are familiar with the name of Sharath Chandra Chatterjee, no relation. <laughs> I wish uh, we had. So he remains the most popular translated, adapted, and plagiarized Indian author of all time, Wikipedia entry. He focused just on a subset of people, Bengali Hindus, a limited set of people. Then what is the appeal of his work? Why is it so popular? Well, he wrote about what he saw and experienced. He knew his characters intimately, and hence he could portray their emotions and feelings so well. So we suggest a similar, uh, some similar ideas and approach here. Uh, Derivatives teaching is not just about studying some mathematical models that has worked in the past and that works with some very uh, strong students. But the idea is to disseminate and make large number of people because derivatives is all over Parvade's life. So we think there's a need to place the discussion in the context of real life, clearly explain the contracts and cleanly present key models. So this is the aim of our book. Readers get a complete understanding of the basic story of derivatives as quickly and efficiently as possible. And then they can build on that foundation and handle hurdles and challenges, which, and we will have some discussion on that, can be substantial. Uh, let me share some stuff from the Amazon review for the first edition. And, um, it's concise, so this is the heading by Rinald Murataj. Concise talks about usage of models, why and how to use BS. BS does not have the usual meaning here, <laughs> as we understand. It refers to Black-Scholes Merton model. Market manipulation and price bubble. This is a superb book for many reasons, but most important one is that it makes you think properly about derivatives and financial markets. The book is concise despite being thick. It gives lots of examples, including case studies and industry examples. It covers first equity derivatives and then moves to interest rate derivatives. And who else to teach 8J model better than its creator, Professor Jarrell? Now, these are people we don't know. Uh, we, uh, I don't think uh, we have met them but they have written some nice things, say, say some nice things about us. So this is another reviewer and you can, and this is all public information. Uh, you will find it in the, uh, well, the webpage, in Amazon webpage. Wow, amazing book. It's both rigorous mathematically as well as extremely well-organized and written. Uh, it reduces the effort significantly required to learn the material significantly compared to those texts. Now, uh, let me be careful here. Those are excellent texts, but it's probably best to get go to them after getting the basic story right from an introductory book like ours. Um, the book's outstanding features, enormous effort devoted to choosing the optimal paradigms and notation and its encyclopedic breadth. And then he mentions, and it, that and suggest that adopted by everyone who wants to get, re, get it right efficiently. Now, we did not pay them or they are not in our payroll. So it reminds me of a little incident. So I wrote an op-ed for one of the major Indian newspapers and uh, I met at a party, the bearded newspaper baron. And I said that, well, I'm not exactly in your payroll, but uh, I published an op-ed and I got paid. And he said, payment, payment. So these reviewers, we are very grateful to them. They're neither in our payroll, nor did we make any payment. And um, 
Well, this is where we can end the presentation, I guess. But we have serious people coming here. So this is just sharing public information and yes, we're ending. That's not enough. We respect our audience. So I will go over carefully the topics that we have underlined. You of course have the option, uh, yeah, of attending, listening. So let's start with an introduction to derivatives. Risks arise in the ordinary business of life. Derivatives provide a set of tools for managing financial risks. Uh, a derivative security or a derivative is a financial contract whose value is derived from an underlying. And the underlying may be a stock price, a commodity price, like gold, crude oil, a notional variable, like the BSE Sensex and NSE Nifty, or an interest rate from the government securities market or MIBOR. So let me just very quickly introduce some contracts and uh, go from there. A forward contract is a promise to trade at a later date at a fixed forward price that is negotiated today. No cash changes hands now. People trade at a fair price. So example, Mr. Farmer agrees to sell corn at forward price, at a forward price of $5 per bushel after three months to cereal maker company. Prices are per bushel, they're about 25 kgs. So the spot price or price cash price after three months, so spot price is for immediate transaction. So if the spot price after that will determine who profits and who loses from this contract. If spot price after three months is $6, farmer still sells at five, uh, loses a dollar, but nobody can tell the future. So it's better than if it was uh, if the price had fallen to $3, the farmer may get wiped out. So the cereal maker benefits here because they are buying for $5, something worth $6 in the market. But both traders have removed price risk. They have fixed the price for future transaction. Or they can trade a futures contract, which is similar to a forward, but standardized trades in an organized exchange, regulated, daily settled. So a daily settled means profits and losses are taken on a daily basis. Or serial maker can pay say 50 cents and buy a call option. And allows the company to buy corn by paying the strike price $4 over the next three months, could be $4, could be $5, depend on what kind of contracts are trading in the markets. Or, and Mr. Farmer can buy a put option. So the serial maker buys a call, which is a right to buy, and Mr. Farmer can buy a put option, which is a right to sell. Okay. Mr. Farmer has an obligation to sell. And so let's say at the strike price over the next three months. And then besides these uh, contracts, these four contracts, swaps are extremely popular. They're exchange of cash flows. They're extensively used. The market is measured in hundreds of trillions of dollars. Two common contracts are interest rate swaps, which pay, so one party pays a fixed rate, another party pays, pays a floating interest rate. And the, uh, it's an efficient way, swaps are an efficient way of transforming cash flows. And there, then there are Forex and currency swaps where counterparties pay in different currencies. Again, it's an extremely low cost, efficient mechanism for transforming cash flows. So in the mar so two characteristics of derivatives, they trade in zero net supply markets. Each buyer has a matching seller. So for stocks and bonds, there's an initial supply. Uh, for the stocks, as you know, it comes through initial public offerings, IPOs. But same with bonds, it may be sold through an auction or there may be a subscription offering. But there are, um, in, in case of derivatives, there's no initial supply. So traders decide to trade and that's how derivatives get created. And it's a zero sum game. One trader's gain is other trader's loss. And then there are some leakages in the form of brokerage costs, transactions costs. 
But the point is, if one person's gain is another person's loss, it's just very hard to make profits in these markets. Now, there are contracts we commonly use, not for the purpose of making profits, but for risk management, like insurance. Insurance companies make money, but they do a, provide a useful service. So same with derivatives. You can do things with your portfolio in a whole bunch of situations. So that's why understanding the basic story, getting that right, and know their uses and abuses and so on becomes so important. Markets began to help. Now I have created the slides a little bit more detailed and probably I will skip some of those depending on time, but uh, World Scientific has planned to share this. So you can go back to them if you have some questions. So the slides are quite detailed. So there are hedgers who trade to reduce price risks. And it may be hard to find a, another hedger with equal and opposite hedging needs. So a speculator who accepts risks to make some profits may become the counterparty. The economists generally view as speculators as benign. They are helpful to the markets. They're different from insiders and manipulators. We'll talk about that later. Now, speculators try to manage books. This becomes important. They reduce risk by entering into another transaction at a better price on the other side of the market. And if the, all these things are organized, then uh, the markets function well. Why study derivatives in personal and business lives, as Bob has emphasized, that, well, you face derivatives. So uh, face volatile prices, hear about derivatives, encounter derivatives in loan people take in input and output uh, purchase or sales decision they make in changing balance sheets, asset liability mix, and so on. So it helps to know how to use derivatives as tools to manage financial risks, understand the importance of flexibility in an economic setting, and some of the powerful forces shaping the markets. One of the big things I learned while writing the book and studying this topic is that for the most time, it's economics and logic that are shaping the markets. Long history. Uh, colleges and universities and institutes offer courses on stocks, bonds, and derivatives. Bob also mentioned that. So these contracts have a long history. In, it all began in Amsterdam, it seems. In 1517, they issued first government bonds. 1602, world's first stock exchange in Amsterdam. And 1550 to 1650, this is an article we discuss in our book a little bit. It has the heading, Amsterdam as the cradle of modern futures and options trading during 1550 to 1650, long time back. Rice futures market in Japan, in Dojima. Small derivatives market existed in major European cities and the USA. But in 1848, modern futures market emerged, and that's the Chicago Board of Trade, now part of the CME group. So the, the markets were set up in 1848 to help farmers hedge their price risk so that they can sell their produce at a fixed price. Still, before 1970, the markets were small. Uh, futures, only futures had a well-functioning market. Financial derivatives were yet to be created. There was no financial derivative. No satisfactory option pricing model existed. And then begin, in, beginning in the 1970s, all these things got transformed. And uh, so opening of introduction of new derivatives contracts, opening of new exchanges, consolidation and linkages, introduction of computer technology. We have a supplement on derivatives in the Indian subcontinent available in the book's website. Uh, we discuss some of the changes all, along these lines that have happened in the Indian market. So corporate financial risk management, this is the major theme of the book. Company, a typical company faces market risks, currency risk, relevant for businesses with lots of imports or exports or the repatriate profits from overseas operations, interest rate risk, most companies are cash strapped. So interest rate fluctuations affect their uh, 
um, cost of funds and influence their investment activities and commodity price risk. Now, how macroeconomic forces, so let me give you a flavor of this. So these risks came, they were specific market developments. These were not accidental. Beginning in 1944, the, many of the countries operated under the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates. Currencies were convertible to US dollar. Dollar was convertible to gold at $35 per ounce. $35. Now it is what? 50,000 uh, for 10 grams in India and approaching 2,000 per ounce in US. So rising gold prices helped other nations. They were buying gold at $35 per ounce from the US and selling it at a higher price. So there was a decline in gold reserves. So President Richard Nixon said enough of this nonsense from US perspective and ended Bretton Woods system. So now the currencies float against each other and there's a need arose for hedging currency risk. If the government or someone manages to fix prices, there is no need for derivatives. Derivatives are needed only if there is price fluctuation. So the next year, 1972, Chicago Mercantile Exchange introduced foreign currency futures. Now that's with the currency. And then interest rate risk, during 1950s and 1960s, interest rates were low and relatively stable. During 1970s, supply shocks led to high inflation rates. And then in 1979, instead of fixing interest rates, the US Federal Reserve Bank began targeting money supply growth. So developments during 1970s led to volatile double digit interest rates, need for hedging interest rate risk arose. And then Chicago Board of Trade introduced in 1975 Gini May futures based on uh, the housing market. In 1977, treasury bond futures, they became extremely popular. Currently, the Fed uses discretion rather than rules for monetary policy, and you find interest rates fluctuating all over the world for the most part. They remain volatile and interest rate derivatives are actively traded and they are among the biggest size of the financial market. Interest rate derivatives are measured in uh, hundreds of trillions of dollars. Now with commodity price risk, so this is a Reuters CRB index, little hard to see, but what is happening here is, uh, let me just point out, uh, and you can create the, this kind of uh, graphs with Excel, your students can do that. So up until early 1970s, the, this index, which is an average of different commodities that was relatively stable. Then during 1970s, you see fluctuations. And then in early 2000, you see that there's a big jump and then there are big swings. So it becomes important to manage commodity price risk. And why this happened, it took off in the new millennium. It's due to, well, some people say speculation. There was a strong demand for developing countries, including China and India for commodities and commodities entering into investment portfolios. And now you can do these things. There are different ways of doing that. Uh, you can buy ETFs, exchange traded funds and so on. Now companies also look for natural hedges. This is taken from our book. So people sometimes organize businesses in a way so that different risks offset each other. So this is something uh, inspired by a newspaper ad I saw way back in the 1980s. So it's raining and this guy is selling umbrella, sun comes out, umbrella business is gone and now he's selling sunglasses, sun cargo. So people do that, companies set up factories in different parts of the world, and that way they can avoid some of the currency risk. They can uh, create local jobs, which is, uh, goes well with the, the, the politicians in the country and so on. So those are examples of natural hedges, locating manufacturing near where you're selling your products. 
So there are different risks. And 1974, Basel Committee and IOSCO, they uh, have this report and which has been since then has been the, the main way people look at. So they identified five kinds of risks, price risk, and that would be our main focus. Credit risk is a subject of advanced research. Exchange traded derivatives are nearly free from it. Liquidity risk that you try to sell and there is no market, that's a persistent problem for traders. Operational risk about human mistakes, this is something one has to live with. Legal risk, the contracts are not enforceable. That is not a problem for exchange traded contracts, but when you're trading in over the counter markets, it can be a serious problem. Uh, teaching major derivative pricing models, finding a forward price. So let me walk you through an example and show how we try to do that. Uh, suppose you want to buy 10 grams of gold one year from now. And the spot price, spot price is for immediate trade is 50,000 rupees. Interest rate is the only carrying cost, say, is the only carrying cost, say 6% per year. Now, when no arbitrage, arbitrage is what holds the markets together. Arbitrage means a chance to make riskless profits with no net investments. So we can show that forward price is just 50,000 times 1.06, 6 percent being the annual return is 53,000 rupees for 10 grams. Any price that is different, people make, will make arbitrage profits, and the prices should converge to that value. Now, replacing numbers with example, give us a formula for forward price. And it's a simple formula. The forward price is the spot price times one plus interest. So, once, so that is the basic idea. And once we have that, next, we can add more structures and enrich the model. Uh, we can use this simple model to value a forward contract that began earlier. We can use this model to find link between forward prices for different maturities. We can introduce continuously compounded interest rates and so on. And then practical use, assuming forward and futures prices are the same or they're very close to each other, we can see how the model works for predicting gold futures prices for different maturities. And I've done that exercise in class. I've given it to my MBAs, some of these prices, and ask them to check using the model. Then you can enrich the model. The model is derived under some assumptions. You can relax those assumptions and build building. Uh, so richer models, you can introduce storage costs, you can introduce dividend income, you can give introduce convenience yield benefits. And then the model can be used to find futures prices for currency futures, for index futures, for commodity futures. So once you clearly understand what is going on with the basic model, and then it becomes an easy extension building on that structure. And we, that is how we present it in our book, chapters 11 and 12. And we can relax the perfect market assumptions. Perfect market means there are no brokerage costs. Now try telling that to your broker. No taxes. Uh, don't try that with the tax authorities. It will not be pleasant, I can tell you. But for models, as a first approximation, we do that. And then later on, we can add these structures. And now instead of a sharply defined price, we will get, get price bounds within which forward and futures prices must lie. Uh, teaching option pricing model. Option pricing is a harder problem. We introduce a single period binomial option pricing model, just a simple model, one period stock price can go up or down. And that is a toy model. It helps us understand the pricing and the idea behind hedging. Hedging means risk reduction. So the, the powerful uh, idea behind this model is that they solve the pricing and hedging problem in one stroke. So you get a price and you also understand how to hedge or manage risks come from them. So then we extend it to a multi-period binomial model. First two periods, then three or more periods. We also show how to set parameters. Now these are standard stuff. 
other books have them. We just try to do it, make it more cleanly. And uh, set parameters to make the model practical and realistic, extend the model, use it to price a variety of options. And then finally, we introduce a uh, Nobel Memorial Prize winning Black Scholes Merton model for pricing European equity option. We show how to, again, standard stuff. But we do that with an eye towards generalization. And that we will show you in the coming slides. How to price calls and puts using Excel or a good business calculator, and how you can relax some of the assumptions and extend the model to incorporate dividends, price index options, and currency options. We show how to gather inputs from easily available data. And then risk management, we talk about delta and gamma hedging, give numerical examples showing how it works. We talk about which techniques work. We talk about which techniques you should stay clear of. And then finally, in the last part, part four of our book, we have interest rate derivative pricing. Here, Bob Jarrow has introduced an innovative teaching approach. He teaches a course at Cornell based on this. And in interest rate derivatives trade in vast markets. So our presentation of interest rate derivatives parallels the standard presentation that we had that I just mentioned in the previous slides. And all these contracts, they have their counterparts in the interest rate world. Now, interest world, rate world is difficult. If the earlier part is like Alice in Wonderland, the famous children's story of Lewis Carroll, written by Lewis Carroll, now we are entering the world of through the looking glass, which is more complex. The, the movements are more complex. The description is just a more complex book. So same here. So we present the single period, binomial multi-period and Black-Scholes-Merton models, carefully selected notation and parallel presentation because people have understood that what it works for stocks and for commodities, now it's a parallel presentation for interest rate. Interest rates are harder because you have to deal with, so with stocks and commodity, you have one price, but here you have multiple interest rates and they move differently through different time. You have to model their evolution. We introduce the standard assumptions, then depending on the model, we introduce additional assumptions. And uh, continuous time models are easier to explain because if you have this binomial tree, you have to do many, many more computations. And the way Bob has devised this, where well, you can bypass teaching stochastic calculus, spot rate models like Holy and Basicek, or even the old techniques of duration and convexity. So if old approach was like surgery, opening up the abdomen and then taking out the tumor or fixing the hernia or whatever. So this is like today's laser surgery. You go very specific, less intrusive and do very specific work. Uh, so then with the heat gyro Morton model, I will go through this quickly. The slides will be available for you. Uh, there's a forward rate, which you have to determine. Those are the basics. And there's an AJM LIBOR model, which is an easily implementable version. And we use it to price a caplet. A caplet is a European call option on an interest. So those are like little building blocks, like Lego blocks with children play with. So we price these Lego blocks and then we can combine them, take them apart and create more structures. So, but the buyer gets paid the spot price, which is for yield on the shortest maturity risk-free zero coupon bond minus the cap rate when it is positive, nothing otherwise. And then if you can, so now the whole world of interest rate derivative pricing opens up and that is the you know, teaching innovation. We can price a cap which is a portfolio of caplets, and that way we can buy protection for multiple periods. We can buy a floorlet, which is a put option on interest rates. And uh, then we can price a floor and delta hedging that we talked about that works. And uh, most interest rate derivatives can be expressed as combination of these. And we have a note on this approach describing what I mentioned here in more detail available in the books website.
Now, applications and uses of derivatives, which are familiar to you, so I will try to go over this quickly. Hedging output price risk. A gold mining company can fix the selling price of gold by selling gold futures. Hedging input cost. Hedging currency risk. So you can do this with the standard contracts. Hedging interest rate risk. Protecting against a market crash. You can do that by trading put options. Avoiding market restrictions. There may be a short selling restrictions. You can take and a sell position in options or futures, you can avoid that and ruining oneself. A rich can gamble away his inheritance with derivatives. Which brings us up, ties up with regulation. So abuses and manipulations, those are threats to free markets. So like drugs, the derivatives have scopes for appropriate use as well as abuse. So doctors first learn how normal bodies function and then about diseases. We need to learn both about well-functioning as well as malfunctioning markets. Economists, as I mentioned, generally like speculators and believe they have a stabilizing effect on the markets. But beware of insiders, traders with inside information, or market manipulators, traders who have market power and use them to twist prices to their advantage. They make the marketplace dishonest. So we have a separate chapter on futures regulation and we discuss regulations throughout the book. And we have all the same with market manipulation. And I have done research on that. Bob has, done, uh, has written lots of papers on market manipulation. So that is something that is a concern for regulators. So then uh, let me talk about efficient use of ancillaries and then I will quickly wrap it up. Uh, we have detailed PowerPoint slides and Professor Jay Shirithern, one of our adopters at University of Tasmania in Australia, he likes them. We have chapter and questions and problems. Most chapters have 20 or more questions and problems. Solutions are provided. Excel workings are available. I give students regular problem sets. That way it solidifies understanding. I let them work in groups of up to three students. And they're graded easily, even if they make mistakes. So we don't spend time grading them. We do them quickly. But we, for the midterms and exams, and we, I tell students that those are the ones we do carefully. We also have problems that require Excel use. We have test bank, which gives you more problems for they're made available to the adopters. And then price, we have a program for computing prices. You type in values and you get Black-Scholes prices, you get interest rate derivative prices. But, uh, well, it still works. We have not updated that because most of the teaching seems to have moved into, where people can do things by Excel themselves. We have simple models and students learn how to uh, program them themselves. Now, that is is the final section, section eight, for the regulators. So the markets got developed in Chicago in mid 19th century for, to help farmers manage price risk. Now, over time, regulation grew. Something in the Indian markets and Pakistan and Bangladesh and Nepal and Sri Lanka is um, that whether the market, there are too many uh, speculators at the market. So this is a concern of the regulators. My understanding is that last I checked, Bangladesh has not allowed uh, commodity exchanges yet. There were discussions in the card, economists writing in favor of it, but not much. In Pakistan, we find the exchanges got consolidated and then they built a huge big exchange for trading derivatives and other products. In India, it, the Forward Markets Commission, by the way, I created the Wikipedia entry on Forward Markets Commission. Uh, these are important developments. So they got merged with SEBI to create a super regulator of derivatives markets. In the US, before approving them, US Commodity Futures Trading Commission, this is the federal regulator. They, any proposed new contracts, they would like to see that they're useful for price discovery, help in discovering prices, and for hedging risk management. So these are the issues which regulators face and the different regulatory level at the brokers, at the exchanges, the industry bodies, and the market regulators. Now for the traders, my former colleague, uh, 
uh, Richard Shockley one day told me uh, in the corridors, I like your option strategies chapter, nice presentation. Established professors do not easily change books. It's hard. Uh, we have a, an easier time with uh, professors who are just beginning. Uh, but he did, he changed and he adopted our book for his undergraduate derivatives course. Now what we do, we use a common options price data and use them to carefully introduce a variety of strategies. After this chapter, this is our chapter 15 of our book, it becomes easier to implement trading strategies and to read and understand practitioner books on option trading strategies. So we, again, we are focusing on providing the foundations, the basic stuff. For finance professionals, well, whole bunch of uses. Let me just focus on one, which is financial engineering. How it involves how firms design derivatives to solve practical problems and exploit economic opportunities. Sometimes we combine derivatives to create new derivatives. Sometimes we break down complex derivatives into simpler parts, simpler components to understand them. Examples, convertible bonds, extendable bonds, and you can view convertible bonds as a simple bond, regular bond, plus an option to convert, and you have to price them separately. And arbitrage is the adhesive, the glue that holds them together. So likewise, there are different securities that are being introduced. So they may appeal to the investors. They, may, they are useful for hedging some of the risks for the company, whole bunch of uses. So once you carefully understand them, then you can create these contracts and ask for regulatory approval for selling. Finally, for the accountants, we talked about these three risks, commodity price risk, uh, currency risk, and interest rate risk. So this is from uh, the first chapter of our book. You can see that in the current assets, cash and cash equivalents, you have interest rate risk. With account receivable, you have interest rate risk. If it's from another country, it's currency risk. For inventories, there's commodity price risk. With long-term assets, financial assets, property, there are a whole bunch of risks. Same with the liabilities, accounts payable, interest rate risk, currency risk, financial liabilities, pension and fund obligations, pension fund obligations, ownership of shares, and then there are employee stock options. Many companies give stock options to their uh, employees, how to price them, how to correctly account for them. So accounting profession has a whole bunch of things to do. And it's a so there are, I see challenges at three levels. It's a difficult discipline to master. Trades are subject to complex tax laws and there are strict accounting and financial reporting requirements. So this creates a paradox. Today's accounting students are required to know more about these topics at a time of their rising complexity. Chartered accountants, cost accountants, company secretaries have derivatives in their syllabus. Derivatives used to be off balance sheet items. Then over time, astute traders use them to save tax dollars. Unwise trades led to large losses. Crashes and crises shook the markets. Corruption and cheating scandals give derivatives a bad repute. Lawmakers, regulators, the accounting profession have responded to these developments. Tax laws have grown complicated. Pioneering PAS 133 and current complex, more complex, ASC 815 and IFRS 9 were developed for measuring of accounting for and reporting of together of derivatives trade and hedging activities. But, so there, it's a time of growing complexity and there are no good textbooks. Well, let me share with you what we found. Our derivatives textbook discussed, the first edition came out in 2013. So it talked about Procter & Gamble companies, derivatives usage. So in 2008 annual report had a discussion of derivatives, which a student reading our book would have mostly understood they would probably understand 90% of what was going on. But when we are updating it, we found that in the 2016 annual report, a discussion of derivatives that lies beyond the way beyond the scope of our book. There's hedge accounting, there's a whole bunch of things which are thrown in. So unfortunately, an introduction to accounting and taxation of derivative securities 
it does not exist. Uh, there are some books there. Rachel Abdel Khalik, professor at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign, has a book. It's an advanced textbook. It's a nice discussion of some of these topics, but no end of chapter problems. Many of the topics are introduced ad hoc. Juan Ramirez's Accounting for Derivatives. It, he's an industry expert. Nice set of examples. Reviewers state that this 747 page book's discussion is comprehensive and clearly written. Still, the book has no end of chapter exercises. Basic derivatives I found. I have this, both these books that introduce in a somewhat ad hoc fashion. Uh, Price Waterhouse has derivatives and hedging. They have uh, these uh, nice volumes, but again, these are well, these are comprehensive content, pleasing to read and useful, but they're more useful to advanced practitioners, not for beginning students. And these are not textbooks. And I could not find a single textbook on taxation of derivatives. David Shapiro has a volume on taxation of equity derivatives, 2005. So that has been 15 years. It's a spiral bound volume written by a lawyer. PwC's income taxes, it has little sections on that that last updated 2019. Again, not a textbook. Pabosi has the uses of derivatives in tax planning. This is like 19 years old. So that's it. Let me end here. Thank you for staying with us and for contact information, write to, please write to sales at wspc.com for examination copy, access to ancillaries and, and these email addresses for questions on the book. Thank you so much for spending time with us. Okay. So any okay. questions? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's question and answer time. I have received some questions, and I would request uh, some uh, the participants to keep keep posting their questions uh, um, uh, while I'm sp I'm po posing these questions to Professor oh. Dave. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah My go. question goes like this: How would the textbook suit courses taught in India? Well, we provide the basics and that is the problem we have. Ideally, we would like to have a book like this for the Indian market, but that would probably take 500 to 1000 hours of work. So it, which is something which would be great to do that. Now, it is also the idea here is that the Indian, the, the professors in India, they bring in their expertise. They can supplement the teaching with uh, our book and they can add there. So we are not replacing them. So we are just empowering them in the sense we have the basic stories right. Uh, it frees up time for them so that they can build the stuff which is India specific. Thank you. Yeah, uh, you did talk about uh, supplementary materials. So there's a specific question on supplementary. What kind of supplementary materials are, are included in the books? Can you just yeah, uh, we have, yeah, let me re-emphasize that because that becomes important. We have very detailed PowerPoint slides and uh, they're detailed. So it is easy for you to cut. Well, typing in and adding is more work. So it is more detailed than you would like, but so you can just remove, cut, and that way you can create your own slides. So, and then we have questions and problems. So they are become very important for students understanding. So I give regular problem sets and you can give them uh, to the students. Many of them use Excel and that way solidify their understanding and there's a test bank. So it becomes easy to have a set of, there are a set of questions and then you can modify them and create your own. We have a, some of them, you can just change the numbers. We can also provide you with the Excel workings of many of these questions, most of these questions. So uh, that way it, is, it becomes easy to create midterm exams and final exams. Thank you. And uh, people are also very curious to know that where else uh, in the world this text is being already used. Uh, we have been fortunate. So uh, although uh, the challenge is making derivatives widely used, that is yet to be done. 
but uh, 2013 is when our first edition came out. We have 21 countries, more than 75 universities. It has been used in diverse courses. For example, courses on uh, oil and shipping, those in, in England, whole bunch of courses. Bob teaches a course on interest rate derivatives. People have used it to teach masters. People have master students. In Australia, we have a big uh, market. We are fortunate. University of Melbourne, five professors are using them. So they have like large classes. So it's uh, like 400 students. This year it is less because of the COVID uh, pandemic. B1, which is Europe's second largest business school, in Norway, there are three professors using it. At Cornell, multiple professors have used that. And they have found, interestingly, uh, at Cornell and in Melbourne, when they use our book for teaching the basic derivatives course, for a second course, the enrollment has gone up. And the second course, they based it on John Hull's book, Professor Hull's book, and Professor McDonald's book. So we are kind of all together in this. Thank you. Okay, there's a specific okay, yes. question by M. Ajay Kumar. He writes, uh, from my experience of teaching derivatives, I find that students find mathematics involved in pricing models a bit tough, especially in introductory courses. So is it necessary to cover all the mathematics, especially when these are softwares where there are softwares which can take care of mathematical model? Uh, yeah, uh, good question, Professor Kumar. Well, what we try to do here is, well, our chapter two is interest rates. We define simple interest rates, comp uh, compound interest rate, continuously compound interest rates. So we have it at a level that where a good high school student with a high school mathematics can follow the discussions. So that way, and as uh, we discussed, that you can teach, just use some very basic mathematics to get the main ideas across. And then uh, perhaps, well, then you can use that our program that we have, but you can also encourage students to do things hands-on by building their own Excel or using business calculators. So the basics, now, what we have also side by side in extensions, more advanced stuff. So you, we can choose. You are in the driver's seat. You are in control. But the basic story can be told to even like first or second year undergraduate college students at that level. Thank you. Uh, another specific uh, question uh, from Archana Nair. How would you suggest teaching interest rate arbitrage in currencies to undergraduate students? Uh, teaching interest rate arbitrage. Uh, thank yes. you, uh, Professor. Um, so here the idea is when if you're teaching currency, so we have that early in the context of forwards and futures. So, and then where we have like a little simple example, we have a graph showing that, a diagram, what is going on. So please take a look at it and see, and please feel free to write to me if you have more specific questions, we can talk about that. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, Mayank Pandey, the teaching resource copy available if faculty wants. So that is, that you can, you can, you have shared in your screen also, just, just yeah. talk about it. Yeah, yeah please approach uh, World Scientific and uh, they are handling that. Thank you, Professor. Mahendra Swami, which book is best for your journal entries to derivatives? Which book is best for journal entries to derivatives? General entry to derivatives? Uh, uh, journals, <laughs> journals. Yeah. Oh, the journals. Journals uh, have uh, more advanced uh, publications. So they have research stuff. The four major, uh, three or four of the major journals, Journal of Financial Economics, Review of Financial Studies and Journal of Finance. They really have advanced stuff. You can carefully offer some readings, but generally they are for the understanding of the professors. Now then there are Journal of Derivatives, 
which is specifically devoted to derivatives. And we have a publication there. I have a publication there. Now that is also uh, research level advanced stuff. So there are articles here and there, but it's uh, now then there are financial analyst journal and some of the practitioner journals uh, which might be having derivatives. And so you can browse them and find maybe a stories of interest. Risk magazine, very expensive. They have, uh, they, uh, that has lots of advanced practitioner stuff. And we have stories from the risk magazine uh, in our book. So if you can find, if you have access to that, risk has lots of very current advanced practitioner stuff. They have some research articles, but they also have what is going on the most advanced recent uh, current practices. Thank you. Uh, so uh, this is the last question we can accommodate uh, in this uh, webinar. Okay. How can we, uh, is uh, from Sumay Banerjee, how can uh, we use and apply derivatives in smaller organizations, especially MSME companies, since all the business are critical for economy, but they, they are also and, and grapple with the various price market risks. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shumai. Um, so here the issue is, well, first is understanding the basics and having the basics right. And second, then you have to choose from the different markets. And now earlier, many of the derivatives contracts would be of larger size. Now they have many mini contracts, smaller contracts, and the markets have gone electronic trading. So earlier there were physical traders on the floor now there is a centralized computer which does the trade matching. So which has made it possible to trade a variety of contracts. So for smaller organizations that there may be, so I think the way to think through is that understand these risks, three risks, how they're affecting your business. And then there are other risks and then there are other techniques like value at risk and so on. Value at risk we discuss in the last chapter of our book. So once understanding them, and then you carefully look at and ask the questions uh, that what are the challenges and questions. Now here, uh, the issue is, well, it reminds me of a story when I was uh, doing my PhD at Cornell. So there was, a, I met a chemistry student and he said that he does not wear, does not have lights in his bicycle. And his argument is, if you cannot see me, uh, you cannot hit me. Now that's a funny comment. So he was probably making a funny comment, but in reality, what you cannot see that can hit you. And that is unfortunately is happening with the COVID-19 and in the world, it's things which you don't understand, unfortunately that can hit us. So understanding what is whatever is known very well and thinking through that would be the first step. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so with this question, we have come to the end of today's webinar. Thank you all for attending and thank you, Professor Jarov and Professor Chatterjee for taking time to share your thoughts and insights. It has been a delight having all of you. Good night. Thank you, Jitender. Thank you for being the MC. And uh, if you have any questions, our emails are there. Please feel free to contact us, write us, write to us. Thank you.